Ready for a new algorithm? Let's start with DSNE or, or DSNE. Now, DSNE is an unsupervised learning algorithm and we use it to reduce dimensionality. So far, we have talked about LDA, we have talked about PCA, and now we will be talking about DSNE. DSNE does a great job when we are having complex data with a lot of features that are hard to cluster. So it's a really powerful algorithm. Let us see how TESNI works. Let's say that we have these features that are represented on two axes, and these two features that we have contains three groups. Now TESNI needs to find a way to find those color and find those groups. I mean, visually we can see them, that they are three different groups, but the algorithm does not know that this is a separate group, this is a separate group, and this is a separate group. So how it does that? Well, first, since this is a dimension reduction, we are going to simplify it as much as possible to only one dimension. What this algorithm does is that it samples this space, this 2D space, randomly, and it just puts the points on this one dimension. Okay, so this is like randomly sampled and we still need one yellow. Okay, so let's say the sampling looks like this. How this work is, points that are close to each other are going to try to attract and points that are further away are going to push away. So let's say that we start with this first point. Okay which is, let's say, this first point. Now, blue is far away, so blue is going to try to push it away, but in the same time, it's close to green, so green is going to even attract further than this push, okay? So eventually, this green point right now is going to come closer to the blue one. So it got a little bit closer. Now, this will be taken one step at a time. Let's take the second point. Now, this second point is going to be attracted to this point, but it will be repelled by the greens and the yellows, all of them, right? And the green also is going to repel it this way because the green is further away from blue. So blue right now is going to be stepping a little bit close to, to this blue, right? So it might move somewhere let's say right here okay and this will continue until we end up with until we end up with something like the following well but how does it do that there is some calculations that gonna be happening under the hood so that we can do these attractions but i'm gonna be simplifying this mathematical aspects as much as possible now the first point will be taken and we will be drawing for every point something like this t distribution which is similar to the normal distribution but it this one has longer legs and shorter head okay now we are going to measure the distance between this point and all the other points Let's say the first point is very close to it, right? The first green point. Well, we are going to add a distance that is right here. So with this T distribution, if the point is close to it, we will be putting X's on this distribution that is near to the head. And as the points get further, we will be adding X's away. Okay, so let me put the same color here. Let's say we are measuring the distance to the first green one. It's close because it is close to the tip, okay? Next, we are measuring, let's say, the blue ones. The blue ones are a little bit further away. So maybe the blue ones are distributed, let's say, somewhere right here. And the, now the yellow ones. The yellow ones is even further than the blue ones. So maybe the yellow ones are just being right here, okay? And we do this for every point we have, okay? For the second green point, we would be doing the same thing, like that, like that, and like that, because, well, this is also a green point. Now, let's take the blue point, for example. The blue point has the next blue point next to it, right? So it's close to it. 
so we draw it near the tip. Of course, when I say drawing it, this is a calculation that is happening here, but I'm just giving you the summary of it. Now, here we have some yellow points that are further away. So the yellow points maybe are here, and the green points are a little bit closer, so they are maybe here. And we keep doing this. And what we end up with is a matrix that looks like this. And this is what we will be ending up with. What does this mean? This is a similarity matrix. And take a look here. We are having all the points as columns and as rows as well. When we see red points, it means that the similarity is highest. And the reason of that, because we are comparing the same point to itself. Okay, But right now, with these white squares, it means that the points are similar, okay? So what I mean here, this is point one, this is point one. If you take a look, it's the same point. It's point number one. So of course it is 100% similar. This is why we colored it red. Now let's take this first point, second point, first point, second point. Take the first point and the second point. You'll see that they are labeled white because they are very similar to each other because the distance between them is very close right and we can continue for the others let's say that this is point three let's compare point three with point one which is the blue and the green they are far away from each other so they are not similar this is why we have an x meaning that it's not similar and we can continue this is four five six and this is three four five and six and we can take every point and see if it is similar or not so x mean it's not similar at all white mean it is similar and red mean it is identical okay identical mean because we are comparing it to itself and this is the similarity matrix that we use in order to make now the matrix we created here is for this graph specifically and this will be our reference right now remember our goal is that we have a high dimension and we would like to reduce it to a smaller dimension we need to repeat the same process right now for this small target dimension that we are reducing to. We will be measuring, let's forget about this, this ordered one. So let me delete this just for a second. We don't need this anymore. Now we sampled randomly from the space and now we need to calculate the distances. We need to calculate the distance for every point and just create the same matrix but this time the matrix will be a mess take a look here now it is considering that the green is closed which is correct but here the blues for example are considered away from each other and here it is considering that blue and yellow are similar so if i try to draw this matrix one more time but with these distances i will be getting some really messed up matrix right so if i just try to depict it quickly now this is my matrix take a look let's say the yellows the yellow and the blue looks like they are similar so they will be something like this this is a blue this is yellow so we will be having a point like this Let's take the yellow with the next blue, which is also seems to be close to it. So it may be right here. And we are going to continue filling those numbers in a really weird way, right? I'm not going to be filling it up right now. But the goal is when we are moving these magnets is that we want to create a table that looks like this, but for a lower dimension. So we're going to keep moving these points until we get every row similar to every row so let me give you a simplified example here let's take row one for example let's say that here we have white here we have no similarities and here we have an identical one and by the way identical ones are calculated as zero in the similarity calculation so they are not confused as super similar okay so right now we want to take this row and make it exactly like this row okay all of those need to be the same as all of those and this is what is happening we will be pushing this and changing this matrix this new one until we reach a form that is similar to this one and this is what tsne is about 
and the t here is actually coming from the t distribution that we are using so in summary one we calculate the similarity for the for all the features we have here two we project the data into lower dim dimension and three and three we calculate the t distribution for the lower dimension so for this lower dimension we are also doing all of that and four we keep adjusting the low dimension row to look similar to the high dimension rows until we have a sorted data and this is it this is the summary of what's going on now mathematically there is a lot more going on but i really wanted to give you an overview on how things are happening under the hood right now i want to show you how powerful tsne is do you remember the digits data set that we have talked about where it contains an 8x8 image of handwritten digits and if we want to understand this in terms of features it means that we have an 8x8 features meaning that i have 64 features here that i would like to separate so what i have is i have 8x8 pictures and i have many of them for the label 0 same thing here for label 1 all the way to label 9 okay so this is my label 9 here I have an image as well, 8x8. Eight eight. And if I want to understand them in terms of features, well, it just means that I have 64 features. Every pixel is actually a feature. If I flatten out all the pixels, like we have learned when we were talking about support vector machines in image uh, classification, we flatten the, those images, 64 pixels in one row, every pixel will be a feature so this feature one feature two let's assume that this is the image of number zero and now this is the image of number one this is the image of number two and each is containing 64 pixels all the way like this for the one as well here we have pixels all the way to 64 that's a lot of features and this is a pretty small image imagine if we have larger images how many features we would have let's see if tsne can visually separate those for me now this algorithm is very useful if you have a set of data and you just want to process it really quickly without doing any predictions you just want to do some really quick processing to visualize if they are separable or not i mean this is very important what if your data is not separable at all? Why would you make a lot of effort just trying some pre-processing and stuff just to try to separate it when the data maybe itself is not separable? So TSNE is going to give you this pre-processing and it will help you organize your data analysis for that certain data set. Okay, let's see how we can do that. All right, so we have imported a couple of libraries. We have pandas. We have a TSNE from Manifold. Manifold is, is a set of algorithms actually that do those complex dimension reduction. We have Seaborn for plotting and we have the data sets because here where we will be getting our digits. Let's create our data set. So we have digits is equal to data sets dot load underscore digits. And now we have our digits. Next, let's create our TSNE model. So we will have model is equal to tsne let's say that the number of components is two we would like to reduce the dimensionality into two dimensions and let's pass verbose now verbose is just going to give me an output while we are training this algorithm it will tell me what it is doing exactly while training all right now let's do some fitting so here i'm going to be saying tsne transform and this will equal to model dot fit underscore transform just as usual and we need to pass digits dot data again like support vector machine we won't be passing the images themselves we will be passing the flattened version of the image meaning that all the pixels are in one row next let us execute this as you can see it's training the data so all of those are just the steps to do that 
and we're done training. I would like now to create a data frame, so I'm going to say here pd.data frame because I'm going to put all my information in here. Next, let's store the labels now. So df label is equal to digits.target, right? Because all the labels are in the target right here. If you remember, we've done this in SVM. So the data set here contains digit images flattened version. It also contains the labels for every image. So here are the labels. I'm just loading them from target. Next, we have df component one is equal to TSNE transform. And then we will take the first axis. And the second component will take the second axis. All right. Just like PCA or like LDA. We've done this in other dimensionality reduction algorithms. All right. Now let's do some plotting. SNS.scatterplot. We are going to use the scatter plot here. So here I'm going to be passing them with names because I have multiple of them. So here x is equal to uh, component 1. As a label, y is equal to component 2. Let's continue. Now, what is the hue? The hue is my labels, right? Because I want this map to be colored according to my label. So this will be simply my digits dot target, right? Or we can pass the F label. Doesn't really matter because it is we have already added it here, but that's fine. Next, I would like to choose a palette. Now, SNS supports what we call palette of colors, and we can choose how many colors we would like to have. So here we'll say palette is equal to sns.color underscore palette. Uh, palette is one L. Okay. And here, the name of this palette is called HLS, and we need 10 colors. Okay. Now let's continue. We have the data, which is my data frame. If I run this, here we go. Take a look here. It did a great job separating the data. As you can see, every cluster of color is actually a separate color. The red right here, which is here, is the zero, and it has no impurities. It's just pure group. Now, maybe here, uh, near the fives, we have a nine that was misclassified. And here we have a four that is misclassified. We will see a few points here and there, but eventually the clustering is pretty good. And we can work on these impurities by adjusting the classification algorithm hyperparameters. But for initial view, this is just great. The separation is really, really good. And let's start with a new unsupervised learning algorithm, which is called hierarchical clustering. So hierarchical clustering is unsupervised, meaning that we don't need any labeled data. Let's see an example on how does this interesting algorithm works. Let's assume that we have a data regarding how many cars in every city we have. So let's say we have city number one, two, three, four, and five, regardless of the names right now. And we're going to say how many cars we have in each city. So this is the number of cars here. And let's say here that we have 7 million, 3 million, 18 million, 35 million, and 28 million. So five cities, each containing how many cars do we have in each one. Now we want to see what's the best way to cluster these data. Let's say, let's say that there is a certain threshold that would divide this data set into two or three clusters, depending on the amount of cars we have maybe this clustering is going to reflect the pollution in every city right so this is why we want to maybe determine the amount of pollution depending on how many cars in every city so we may be clustering them for pollution type 1 pollution type 2 etc okay now let's start this algorithm first we need to plot everything together the point is we need to measure the distances between the data we have. Let's see how we can do that. So first, let's plug in all the numbers together. So we have city 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 
And then we have also here 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This is like a similarity matrix, which we've seen in multiple other algorithms. The diagonal for a similarity matrix is actually zeros, right? Or these are the elements that are similar, meaning that they will be zeros because they are similar and we don't want them to be plugged into the algorithm. So 2 with 2, 3 with 3, then 4 with 4, and 5 with 5. Now let us calculate the distance between every point. Let's say between one point 0.1 and 2. What is the distance between point 0.1 and 2? The formula is we take the square of the difference between the two points and then we add a square root. Okay? We are adding the square because if we get a negative value then it will be converted to a positive then we would take the square root. Okay, so this is A, this is B. All right, so we have point 1 and 2. The difference between them is actually 7 minus 3 is 4. Then square of 4 is 16. And then we have the square root of 16 is actually 4. So this formula can be actually reduced to A minus B absolute value. Okay, so what is 1 minus 2 absolute value? It's 4. Now, what is the difference between 3 and 1? It's 11. What's the difference between 4 and 1? It's 28. 5 and 1 is actually 21. And we will be continuing to fill this table. Now, the second entry. What is the difference between 2 and 1? Again, it's 4. What's the difference between 3 and 2? It's 15. 4 and 2? It's 32. 5 and 2? is 25. Next, 3 and 1 is 11. 3 and 2 is 15. Then we have a 0 here. 4 and 2 is 28. 4 and 3 is 17. Then we have 3 and 5, which is 10. And we continue like this. Okay, so as we can see, we have filled the similarities here. So right now, we are going to be merging these values together. So what should we merge exactly? We will take the first row and see what is the smallest value. The smallest value here is 4. Zeros are not taken into consideration. And 4 is produced by 2 and 1. So what we do is we merge 2 and 1 together. And now this table here will turn to the following, we have 1 and 2, and the value is the largest value. So in our case, the value is 7, right? We merged 1 and 2, and we take a value of it of the maximum value. Then we still have 3, which is 18, 4, which is 35, and 5, which is 28. All right, now this table is gone. And we have a new table, and we are going to repeat that. Now, in order to illustrate what's going on, I'm going to be drawing here the following. We have the points 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We have merged 2. So here we are going to connect these together, and the height of this connection will be the difference. Remember, 1 was actually. 3, right? And 2 was actually 7. So the height is the difference between them, which is 4. So here we will go up to 4, and we are going to connect these two together. Okay? And now we are going to continue. Let's continue this. I'm going to be deleting here. And we will start over. We have 1, 2. 3, 4, and 5, and here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay, so here we will have 0. What is 1, 2 with 3? Well, it's 11. What is 1, 2 with 4? 28. What is 1, 2 with 5? 21. Now, what is 3 with 1, 2? 11. And we will continue like that.
And this is the final result. Now we are going to take a look at the next row. Okay, what should we merge? Who is the lowest value? Well, it is this one. The lowest value is this 10 here. We have merged one on two, so we won't look at this row. We will look at the next row that is not merged. So we have 10. 10 is produced by 5 and 3. So now we are going to have a new table containing 1 and 2. Then here we have 3 and 5. What is the value of 1 and 2? 7, 3 and 5. Let's take a look. 3 and 5. Who is the maximum? It's 28. So it's going to have the value of 28. Next we have 4, right? And what is the value of 4? It's 35. All right, so we, we copied the value of 4. Between 3 and 5, we take the maximum value because we have merged them. And then we have the value of 1 and 2 as it is. And this is the new table. Now let's connect. What did you merge? We merged 3 and 5. So let's merge 3 and 5 together. But the height of this will be the difference. What is the difference between 3 and 5? It's 10. So we need to go all the way up to 10 here. Connect. 3 and 5, like this. All right? So far, so good. Let me just write the values of 3 and 5 here. 3 is 18. 5 is 28. Now let's erase. And the table is going to get smaller right now. We have 1 and 2. What is the difference between 1 and 2 and 3 and 5? It's 21. Difference between 1 and 2 and 4 is 28. And we'll continue like that. And this is the result. Now, let's take a look at the 4. Who is the lowest value? It is the 7, right? And the 7 is produced by the 3, 5, and 4. So we have a new data, which is... 3, 4, and 5, because now we have merged 3, 5, and 4, because here it is the lowest value. Now what we do is we take 3 and 5, which are 18 and 28, we add them, which will yield 46, and then we find the 46 difference with 35. So here we added 5 and 3, and then we find the distance with... 35 and the answer is 11 so between 4 and 3 5 we have 11 let's continue let's write that 4 here is for 35 now what is the value of 3 4 5 it is the highest which is 35 and 1 2 is actually 7 let's erase everything and start over we have 1 2 3 4, 5, then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, here we have 0, here we have 0, what is the difference between these two? It's 28, and here we have also 28. It doesn't matter who we pick, we will pick this, and now we have only one group containing 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and their difference is 28. So this is my 28, and we are merging these two together. All right, so as you can see now, everything is connected together. In order to determine the number of clusters, all we need to do is to set a threshold right now, and this threshold will be the one that will determine how many clusters do we have. It makes sense that we set our threshold let's say right here, and we see this threshold with how many vertical lines is it, does it intersect. We have one here and one here. So it is intersecting with two lines, meaning we have two clusters. And these clusters are actually set one and two together, and the others are in a different clusters. It means that one and two with cars density of three million and seven million are in one category, and 18, 35, and 28 are in another category. And by that, we have done this clustering algorithm. 
Now let's take a look at hierarchical clustering. Now this great algorithm is very important in customer segmentation and marketing segmentations. Usually most of customer behavior can be processed with this great algorithm because it gives you a quick insight on the behavior of the customers in your business. So let's take a look at what we are doing here. First we are importing NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and then here we are importing cluster hierarchy. Take a look here, we are using SciPy instead of sklearn. And actually sklearn is built upon SciPy. So SciPy is the infrastructure of sklearn, okay? And here we have this data set which we will look at. We are going to segment those customers and see their behaviors. We are going to say data.head and let's take a look. As you can see here, we have customer ID, gender, age, annual income, and spending score. The more the spending score is, the better for our business because it means that this customer is purchasing a lot and he's collecting score. And here we have this annual income. It could be estimated one during some survey that was conducted in the business. And we have the gender and age. Let's see if we can use the hierarchy algorithm in order to segment those. We are going to talk about dendrograms. Now, what is a dendrogram? If you take a look here, see this diagram that we have drawn? This is actually what we call a dendrogram. A dendrogram will help us see the clustering in our dataset. And right now, we will see how we can implement it in Python. First, we are going to say here dendrogram is equal to ch from the cluster hierarchy we have imported dot dendrogram and then we need to pass the following ch dot linkage and we need to pass our data here and we need to say that the method is called word now this linkage is actually nothing but the this matrix right here that we were implementing okay so we need to specify what type of calculations we want to perform here all right, so this is why we are passing CH linkage to the dendrogram because we are saying that I would like to perform this type of matrix calculation on my dendrogram. Right now, when we call dendrogram, we can immediately say PLT show because they are linked to each other. Okay, however, we still have to solve some encoding right here because if I execute this, you'll see that I got could not convert string to float mail because we did not encode it yet. So let's encode it. We're going to say data is equal to pd.get underscore dummies. And then we will be passing the data. And we should do this before the dendrogram actually. And now we will say plt show. And here we go. These are my customers here on the x axis. And here is my distances that were calculated using that matrix. All right. How about we just decorate it a bit? So let's say plt.title is equal to dendrogram. And let's give a name for the x axis. So plt.xlabel is equal to, is not equal to, this is the customers. And then we have finally the y label, which is, what is my y label? It's the distances. So this is distance. We need an L here. Okay, so we have decorated it a little bit. So this is our dendrogram. And that's really cool. Now, how many clusters do you think we need to have? Now, as we can see here, we can get away with around four clusters. Because if we take a, a line just below 400, you'll see that it will intersect one line, two line, three line, lines, and four lines. Now, the way this algorithm works is that you pass the number of clusters and it will automatically draw this line and just determine the threshold for this dendrogram. So let's do that. Let's continue. Now the algorithm that we are going to import is called agglomerative clustering. And this is the algorithm we have explained when we started this section, which is based on having a very large cluster containing all of our features and then shrinking this until every feature is a cluster on its own, which is explained exactly in this dendrogram. This is what we will use to train our data. All right, so let's start. We are going to call this model is equal to agglomerative clustering. 
let's pass the number of clusters we have agreed that we need four clusters here so n clusters is equal to four so we will be cutting this line right here we have one vertical line two three four meaning four clusters now we need to pass how are we going to calculate the distance between these uh, points we will be passing something called affinity and this is the affinity it's called euclidean we'll use the euclidean method to calculate the distance and then we will pass the linkage again which is again word this is the matrix that we are forming all right so this is our model now let's fit our model so we need to say model.fit and then let's predict so we'll say y predict is equal to model dot predict what do we want to predict of course we need to predict our data now let's run this uh on class n clusters and again we have one missing required argument for fit yes we did not say what we want to fit it's data so we've did this here on purpose take a look when you use this algorithm you cannot say fit and then say predict you need to say something called fit and predict so this is the only uh, method that is available so you need to say here fit underscore predict and you need to take your y predict here okay this is very important because if you try to implement this on your own probably you will follow all the methods we have followed so far in this course but here we, we need to say fit and predict and we run this and we're good now if i just print this y print You'll see that it is actually clustering. So the first three entries are cluster zero, then we have twos, then here we have three, one, three, one, three, one, they are mixed. Well, this is the predictions for my data. So it's like we took this data and those were the predictions. All right, how about we start doing some plots? Okay, now how about we start doing all right, here we did not use the x train x test method, and that's totally fine because I want to segment my customers and see what's going on exactly. So I'm not really trying right now to predict new values, I just want to analyze the market that I have. All right, next, let's do some visual analysis. Right now, what I want to do is to implement some visual analysis on this hierarchy. What we have here is the grouping, right? So we have every data, let's say this is entry one, and here is its group. This is entry two, and here is its group, and etc. Right now, I can plot any two features against it, each other and see if they are being separated or not. This is part of the market analysis, which is to take features, plot them against each other and see which feature affect these clustering the most let's first start with taking the annual income with the spending score is the amount of money the customer is earning is related to how much he's spending let's take a look this is the goal but now there is few pre-processing steps that we need to implement here let's start now i just want to remind you with this numpy trick if i am to say data and then I pass y underscore predict equals equals zero, what's gonna happen is it is going to return to me the indexes of all the entries that have zero. What do I mean by that? Let me explain. Right now, you are saying here, get into this y prediction, which is this array. See where it is zero. It is zero in all of those entries. And then I want you to cut the data set and take a portion of it only where the index at the zeros is the same as the indexes at the data entry, right? So, for example, y prediction equals zero. It is equaling zero in all of those. What is the index here? It's index zero. So we go there and take this entry and add it to the new data that I wanna crop. We will take this first entry. Now, let's say the here that I said I want when it equals one. So I'm gonna be taking the indexes of all of those ones that are in betweens, right? So let's say the index of this is 55. 
I would go here, go to index 55, crop it out, and just return it, right? So this is what we are doing. When we have a data of a length 100 and a prediction of a length 100, I can take this prediction, take any entry of it, and match it to the index of my data set. This is what we will be doing in order to plot those. So we have when prediction equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now we have remembered this uh, NumPy technique. How about we create a list for the entries that I would like to compare? So let's say entries is equal to, let's say initially I would like to compare the spending score of from 1 to 100 versus the annual income. Okay, these are the entries that I would like to compare. What is the next step? The next step is that I would like to crop. Let me show you a simplified example without actually going into for loops now. So I'm going to say data plot is equal to data y predict equals zero. So I would like to strip out this group of zero, okay, when I am plotting these two against each other. Now I'm going to say plt.scatter. If you did not understand yet, just bear with me. We will show this graphically. We'll say plt.scatter, and then I'm going to say here data plot. Now, just one second. If I show you data plot right now, it is nothing but a cropped section of my data set. Let's continue. Now, data plot, what do I want to plot here? Well, I want entries 0, and the y is data plot entries 1. Okay, now if I try to plot this, take a look. We have plotted the first group, all right, which is spending score versus annual income. Now we can plot the second group. You'll see that it looks like this. Now the next group, you will see it looks like this. Third one. See? Now we are going to plot all of these groups in one plot, each with a different color. Every group needs to have its own color. Okay? Let's do that. I'm going to say here 4, i in range between, let's say, 0 and 3, because we know that the limit here is 3, in range from 0 to the max of y predict, meaning that get the maximum number of y predict and loop there. What is the maximum number here is 3, right? So if I have more clusters, let's say we have 5 clusters, so the maximum number would be 4, so here it will be counting up to 4. Okay, let's continue. What we would like to plot is this, calling i, because we want to iterate over all the groups. And, well, let's create an array for colors. So here I'm going to say colors is equal to red, blue, green, purple, and orange. And now we need to color this. So here I'm going to be passing c is equal to colors i. Let's execute this. So far, we have plotted three groups. Let's add one here because the max need to max plus one, actually. So let's do that. And as you can see, we have plotted all the groups. Now let's label the axes here. So I'm going to say here, I'm going to do that before the loop. So I'm going to say plt.title is equal to customers clustering. Let's do the same for the X label and Y label. So we have PLT dot X label. What is the X label? Well, it is entries zero, right? Whatever we are comparing. And PLT Y label would be my entries one. Execute this. Here we go. Here we have the spending score. Here we have the annual income. And you can see for these two features compared to each other, we are clustering those. So what is this telling us actually? We have a group, their annual income is, let's say, between 20,000 and 40,000, and their spending score is actually ranging between 0 and 100, okay? Next, we have a group where their annual income is between 40,000 and 60,000, okay? We'll see that their spending score is around between 40 and 60. Well, that's interesting to know. Then let's take a look at the purple group. We will see that their annual income is actually 80k and above, and their spending score is between 0 and 40. And there is another group that their 
annual income is the same, which is above 80, and their spending score is between 80 and 100. So as you can see, we have segmented those into multiple groups. I just want to add a few notes before we conclude this clustering section. As you can see right now, the data right here is pretty scaled. It means that here we have a scale between 0 and 100, and here we have a scale between 0 and 140. So they are really close to each other. If the scales are not matching or at least close to each other, we will be getting some really bad results using hierarchical clustering. And the solution to that is to actually scale the data before we pass it. So we would come to this step right here, we would use uh, the standard scalar from sklearn, and then we would be passing our data, in case that the units here are not matching. Let's say that here the spending score is 39, and it is in the range between 1 and 100, and for some reason, the annual income is expressed with 15,000 adding three zeros here. This will change the whole equation, and here we must actually use some data scaling in order to get better results. At this moment, we are ready to start introducing random forests. Random forests are just a bunch of decision trees, maybe hundreds of them, running at the same time just to calculate this label. Now, this might seem complicated, but it's really not. Let me show you how it works. We start first with something we call bootstrapping. Now, really don't be fooled with this fancy name. It's just random sampling of whatever data I have. So, for example, let me consider that this is the if somebody likes meat, somebody likes Coca-Cola, vegetables, eat more than three times. And this is my label at the end. So what we are going to do is we are going to take one of those five randomly and just put them here. Let's say that the random choice felt on this initially. So we have yes, yes, no, yes, and the label is yes. Let's say that we have sampled something else. We might say here no, no, yes, yes, and then we would say here that he does not like. Okay? So we will do this multiple times. Now we can say that this is my first tree, okay? Now let's create a second tree. We will do also the same thing. We will put all the columns, and then we will take a random sample from here, two samples randomly. And it's totally fine if we repeat a sample from above. So maybe we will be passing here n, n, y, y, n, because we are taking random samples. So repetition is totally okay. And then maybe here we take something new. Let's say yes, 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 and yes. And this is my second tree. And assume that we will be doing around four trees. What did we achieve by that? Well, we had too little and we are doing too much. What do I mean by this? We had only five samples here. And let's say that we are making 10 trees. This will lead that we are we are having around 20 samples around here, right? Because we have 10 trees, each one has two. This will lead to 20 samples, even though we only have five. So this is what bootstrapping is. Now we are going to explain aggregation. Aggregation works as follows. This is my first tree, right? We are going to pick one random column. Could be, does he like meat? Does he like Coca-Cola? Does it like vegetables? Anything. We will pick it randomly. And it will be the root of my tree. We call the first node here root. Okay? This will be the root of my tree. Let's say randomly we picked Coca-Cola. And then we will continue. We have yes or no, right? It's like building a regular tree. Then we will choose two random columns right now except for the one that we have chosen already okay so this one is not okay right now because we have already chose it now we will pick two randomly let's say we got does he eat more than three times and let's say that we got the vegetables okay and then we will sample again but every time when we are picking randomly we just don't pick the main 
node we are choosing like here it's a three times like here this node if he eats more than three times we will not pick it when we are choosing these two okay so let's say here this is three we cannot pick three we can pick any of those three though let's say that we have picked meat randomly and here let's say that what was picked is the label actually even the label can be picked let's say here that we picked c and the label these are the labels when we pick the label we stop right we don't need to pick any further and let's say here that we pick two labels and here let's say that we pick two labels so this is label one and this is also the second label okay now that we have created our tree we can train it we will be training this tree using the data that we have bootstrapped right so we can train it on this data on this data now after you trained it your tree is actually ready to be used the next step is going to be to create another tree with randomness using the second tree okay this is the data we have this is the data that we are going to train our tree on and then we are going to do aggregation to create a tree that maybe looks something else maybe it has one node here one node here and that's it then here we have a node like that then we have a node like that and just a node like that okay so the trees can vary a lot in shape and this is what makes random forests very powerful now that we have trained all of our trees we could have hundreds of trees then we can go to the next step but i just want to mention something very small here we said when we chose our root let's say we said that we can pick up from any of those four actually usually we need to determine how many variables can we pick meaning that if we pick this maybe we'll say now we will pick two random variables let's say this and this and we will be assigning them into these nodes all right so you might see this when you read some books regarding random forests okay so right now you have your hundreds of trees and now it's time to ask yourselves what are we going to do with them we have trees they are trained but how do we do predictions and here comes the prediction actually let me erase this now let's say that we have new data here i have a new data and i want to predict it so i don't have the label i have only the column let's say that the columns are something like yes yes no no and i want to predict the label here does this person like burgers or not i really don't know what we are going to do is we are going to vote so here the votes for the trees that said yes he likes burger and here is the vote for the trees that said no this person does not like burgers now trees are going to make different predictions what do i mean by that we will pass this data to each tree and we will collect the result let's say we passed it to tree number one tree number one said yes let's say tree number two we passed this data and it ended up with yes he likes burger as well now let's say that we passed it to the third tree it said no let's say now we passed it to the fourth tree it said yes and we continue like that some are saying no some are saying yes and then let's say we are done with all of our trees now we can do the prediction we will just take a look at the scores and we will see that more trees said yes than trees that said no what does this mean it means that this label should be yes see what random forests do they are extremely fast in training and they are extremely accurate so it is just a really wonderful algorithm and it's also very easy to implement now of course when we go implement it in python we will just call a function through our sklearn library and and that will be it but this is what's going on under the hood and i really wanted to show you how great it is now one last thing this operation of bootstrapping and aggregating right we are aggregating and bootstrapping is called bagging so if you see the term bagging in random forest you will know what we are talking about it's just this bootstrapping and aggregating and that's it
And now, after we have learned about random forests, let us apply this to a certain data set and let's predict some values. The data set we are going to use is the cardiovascular disease data set. It means that we have a list of patients and we have multiple criteria for those patients which will identify or try to predict if this person has the cardiovascular disease or not. Now, we have imported pandas. Now, let's take a look at this data set. First, we have imported pandas, and then we have imported this data set, and here the separation is by a semicolon, so it's important to pass this semicolon here. And if we run this, we will get this data set. We have ID, age, gender, height, weight, AP high, AP low, cholesterol, glucose. We have a lot of features, and lastly, we are predicting the label of this person has cardiovascular disease or not. Now, I just want to show you that if you don't pass this separation here, you're going to get a data set that looks like this. And as you can see, the data set is separated by semicolons. Every, every column is actually separated by a semicolon. So let's get back. Here we go. Now, one thing weird that we have noticed is that the age is in terms of 18,000, 20,000, and the reason is the age here is measured using days. So we need to convert this into years. And also we need to drop the ID. First, let's drop the ID because the ID really has nothing to do with if that person has the disease or not. So we'll say df is equal to df dot drop. What do we want to drop here? The ID. We will specify the axis being one. And next, as I said, I would like to convert this into years. We do that using two steps. We divide by 365, right? If we divide by that, we get the years. And then we convert this into integer because I don't want a float 37.5, right? I just want an integer age. We can do that simply by using a pandas method, which is called div. It will take a whole column and divide all of its value with that certain parameter that you will pass. So here I'm going to say df age is equal to df age dot divide by 365. Now if I am to print this data frame, you'll see that I got the age, but it's a float type. So here I need to pass another method, a method that is similar to numpy. AS type, and we need to say here integer. Now, as you can see, we got the age in the expected format. We have 70,000 patients in this data set, so it's a really large data set. All right, now let's create our features and our labels. The features is all of those, and the label is this one because this is what we would like to predict. So x here is df.drop right because we want everything except cardio so i'm just going to throw away cardio and here we're going to say the axis is equal to 1 next we need the features which is df and simply we will pass cardio because the cardio is the only labeled column that i need and that's it now let us simply uh, split our data so from sklearn dot model underscore selection import train test underscore split and now we have our x train y x test then y train then y test just as usual nothing new here we have train test split features labels and then the percentage let's make it 20 percent so test size is 0.2 and let's run this and that's it now we have prepared our training set testing set and we've done the pre-processing on the data now let's build the model and now we are ready to create our model we need to import a new thing here actually i'm going to add all of my imports and put them just here above so i have a new import which is called from sklearn dot ensemble import random forest classifier okay 
Now let's compile this. No. Yep, we have a missing arg here. And here we go. Let's compile this as well. Okay. Now let's create the model. So we have model is equal to random forest classifier. Now we need to pass how many estimators do we want. Meaning that how many trees are we intending to use here. So I'm going to say n estimators is equal to 100 initially. We might need more. And by default, bootstrapping is actually set to true, so we're not going to set it. This is initially what we need. Now, there are way more parameters than that that we can tune in, but we just want to get the model to work at first. So let's say here, model.fit, of course, like usual, x-train and x-test. Then we need to do some predictions, so predict, so y underscore predict. Let's go to equal to model.predict, and we have x-test. Then let's print out our Y predictions. We have an issue. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this should be Y uh, train. All right. Now let's get it to work. Now we are training our model. And here we go. And by that, we have created a very simple random forest classifier. Now it's time to evaluate. All right, let's continue. Now it's time to evaluate the score. Evaluating score is like any other machine learning algorithm. It's no difference. All we need to do is just say from sklearn import dot metrics import accuracy underscore score. Let's run this. And now we are going to print this accuracy. So I'm going to say hey, accuracy is equal to accuracy underscore score. And we need to pass y test and also we need to pass y predict so y print now let's print the accuracy and we will see that with this many estimators we got an accuracy of 70 percent let's say if i increase the estimators to 200 will i get any better results this will take a little bit of time and now it's done we will see that the accuracy did not actually change let's try 500 estimators and let's run the score we will see that the score increased a little bit more all right now we are going to extract what are the parameters that are actually affecting this decision let's take a look Random Forest supports a method that helps us extract what features are with the most importance. Now, this can be very helpful to see which features affect our accuracy and model the most. Let's implement this. Now, if I come here and just say model.feature underscore importances underscore, we will be getting a list of percentages. Now let's map out what every percentage here means. If I am to print X columns, you'll see that I got all the columns I have. Now all I need to do is just pass these together because this index corresponds to this index in the feature importance. So simply I'm just going to say for I in range between zero and the length of X dot columns so we are going to sweep the number of our columns and here we are going to say print x dot columns i and then we are going to be printing model dot feature underscore importances underscore i multiplied by 100 what am i doing here i'm just getting the name from this list from the x columns and I'm getting the percentage from the model feature importance one by one. And I am multiplying the percentage by 100. See here so that we can get a percentage actually. And then we are just going to add this percentage symbol. Now if I run this, here we go. This is how much each feature is affecting. So age is affecting by around 16%. Height is affecting. Weight is maybe the most affecting factor here with 23%. Then we have the AP high, AP low. Cholesterol does not have that much of an effect. Glucose as well. 
smoking does not seem to be having that much of an effect alcohol as well and being active or not so age height and weight and epi high seem to be the top four that are affecting our model and as we can see right now our randomized search cross validation is done how can we see what are the best parameters in order to see them we need to call a method on the model that is called best parameters we are going to pass our model name and say best underscore params another underscore now if we run it we will see that it did best when the criterion was genie max depth of 10 and number of estimators equaling to 3000 let's test this out if we go back to our model which is right here i'm gonna change this to 3000 i'm gonna pass a max depth equaling to 10 and finally i will pass criterion equaling to genie now if i run this it's actually criterion not s let's run it it's gonna take a little bit more time than when we had 100 estimators this is like 30 times more let's wait to see the results and here we go now let's see the accuracy okay the, so the accuracy actually increased by around one or two percent well at least we got the most out of this data set with this data set that we have and with those patients that we have and with the least amount of pre-processing we actually got a result of 74 percent which is not really that bad which is an average accuracy actually okay that's really good and by that we have concluded this problem how about we teach machines robots games how to finish a task wouldn't it be cool if they learn all of this on their own? This is what is this section is about. It's about finding a way to let machine learn on its own with the least effort and interference from us the humans. Let's do some coding and see how all of this will wrap out. Welcome back to you guys. And now we are going to start a new section, which is called reinforcement learning now this is a very exciting branch of machine learning and with reinforcement learning we can actually teach objects or stuff around us to do things well let's say autonomous cars use some type of reinforcement learning do you know those boston robots that we see being advertised a lot we see them walking we see them jumping well they use some kind of reinforcement learning models in order to perform their actions so those robots for example had no idea how to perform these actions but some reinforcement learning techniques and besides some other techniques were used in order to teach it how to do that now let me give you a very simplified example which also we will use to learn this concept Let's say that we have a map, okay? And here I will be having a car, okay? Now there is some walls around here. The car can go this way, of course. Now there is some walls here, walls here, some walls here, okay? And the car need to navigate this map. Now let's assume that this car is actually a taxi and this taxi need to pick up people. Let's say it needs to pick up people from this place. This is pick up and it needs to drop people at this location. Now the car need to navigate all of this map in a certain way to reach this point first and then to get to this point second. Okay, now how can I teach this taxi to do these actions? Of course, I can just tell it that you can go 
all the way here to this location and then go all the way here to this location i mean i can't hard code how it should go right i can tell it to go this way then this way i could create a map for it on how to, to run but this is not too practical because this will not generalize on other problems let's say that i have another map that contains more walls that are blocking the impasse that are blocking the roads the roads well then this hard-coded route will not work right so what do you need to do what we want to do is some kind of reward system a reward system is very simple you let the car explore on its own okay and whenever it does a good job you just give it 10 points whenever it does a bad job you can maybe take two points from it okay so the car will always try to do a good job by getting more rewards and we are going to store all of those rewards and the actions they did okay in a table and this table will help this car navigate okay now what do i mean by a reward here let's say that the car did a good job by reaching this point well i would give it 10 points let's say that the car hit a wall i would maybe take one point out of it okay i want to introduce you to the concept that is called agent now agent is my taxi this concept you're going to see them a lot in reinforcement learning so it's important to learn them agent is the taxi we have we have the actions what are the actions well it is going up down right and left let's say that those are the actions that are allowed by the car let's also add pick up and drop so we have around six actions that we can perform and maybe we can throw them randomly at the car and they're rewarded if somehow it reached here and give it a penalty whenever it does something wrong something wrong like hitting a wall or maybe trying to drop out without having passengers or maybe trying to pick up from the drop location okay so there is actually a lot of actions that can be done so this drives us to define what we call state a state is what is the state of the car the state of the car could be that it is in x y point and then going right okay this is actually a state it could be in x2 y2 point and picking up all right so there is a huge space of states this is called the state space and it is the combinations of all the states that we can be in meaning location and actions together the state space contains something called next state meaning that we can create a predefined table state a predefined table that contains state and then next state this could be randomized or this could be done by hand well it could be anything what do i mean by next state let's say if state is at the moment is by the car being at x y let's say that this is my x axis this is my y axis with respect to this map let's say we are in x y and moving upward let's say that this action is done now what is the next state let's say this is a state let's say we want to execute the next state now we can go to the table and take it from there and here it could be maybe x1 y1 and maybe going right this time okay this is what the next state is there is one more definition that i want to talk about which is called the reward table the reward formula reward formula or policy is how we reward this agent and we are going to talk about that more while when we progress it's basically 
how do we calculate when to reward and when to not? So I'm really excited to start this section with you guys. Let's get started. What we would like to do right now is to open Anaconda and install these two. We are going to be installing the gym library, which is one of the most famous libraries that are used to learn reinforcement learning because it has some ready to use models that helps you understand these concepts. These models are like small games where you need to solve them based on your knowledge. You can brute force them by trying maybe all the possibilities, or you can use machine learning techniques in order to be able to solve it. Okay, so what I need you to do is download this first entry first, the Conda install Jim Atari, and the next one is by pip installing Jim all. Copy these two and get them installed and then we would be ready to start. If you're facing any issues, please write to the Q&A of this lecture or write a comment. Let us write some code and let us try to solve the taxi problem we have talked about before. So first I would like to import Jim and then we need to start an environment. We can just say environment is equal to gym dot make. And here make sure that you type taxi dash v3. In the future there might be v4. So if it says that v3 is not available anymore, all you need to do is just type v4. But we are still at v3 by the time we are recording this. Then we, you need to say dot environment. So this will initialize the environment for you, and then let's render it. So we'll say environment dot render. So rendering is to show you what kind of environment we are looking at. Our goal here, the yellow box here is our taxi, and those lines are just some obstacle, some obstacles that we should not be touching. Right now, our taxi need to pick up the passenger from location Y and it needs to take it to location R. Okay, let's see how we can do that. First, I would like to introduce you to, th to some methods. First one is called environment.actionspace. And we have six actions actually. As you can see, we have discrete six which are up, down, right, left, pick up, and drop. Next, we have our observation space. So we say environment.observation space. And we see that we have 500 space points, which are all the X and Y locations that we can be at. Okay, what's next? Next is environment.b now take a look at this this table is very very important this is why the gym library is very easy to use it is actually containing all the states all the next states uh, all the reward points and everything so what i mean exactly is let's say let's take a look at this number we have multiple entries and we are having 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have entry 0. It contains a, another dictionary here. Right? This is entry 0. And this is the dictionary it contains. Now this dictionary has 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Which corresponds to all the actions we have. We have up, down, right, left, pick up, and drop. Okay? This is what these numbers represent. Now... Every action contains a list as well. Here it's a probability of 1. Here it is the next state, meaning that if we are at 0 right now, and let's say 0 means go up, okay? And we said we want to go up, we would be jumping to state 100, okay? Meaning we would go all the way down to state 100. Okay, and now it depends if we press 1, 
If we go right, we would be executing this and jumping to state zero again. See, so it's like going upwards and downwards. So here we are at 100. If we drive back, then we jump back to state zero, and this is my state zero. Again, if we go forward, we jump to state 100, and we are at 100. See what I mean here? So these states are in sequence. Next, this is the reward or penalty points. Minus 1 is a penalty, actually. And if I jump to 100 from 0, like we've talked about, would we be getting any points? Probably not. No, we would be also getting a minus 1, because this is a wrong action, as you can see. Assuming that we repeat the same action. And even, let's say we were at 0, and we jump to state 10, and then let's say we try to pick up or drop, let's say 4 is pick up and 5 is drop, we'll see that we would be losing 10 points. See? So this table tells you everything. Now let's say that we are at state 0, and we are looking at this flag. This flag is to indicate if we have picked up or dropped correctly. So can we find the true here? There are some values, four values of true, meaning that we have picked up or we have dropped a passenger correctly. As you can see, we have four locations that we are allowed to do that. Okay? So this table tells you everything, actually. And we are going to use it throughout this exercise. Welcome back to you guys. Right now, we are going to continue creating our example to see how we can get this taxi to drop a passenger somewhere. What I'm going to do right now is try a brute force method to solve this problem. I'm not going to be using reinforcement learning yet. I just want to explore this table and jump from state to state to try to brute force a solution that will lead me to drop a passenger. Initially, I'm going to be assuming that there is a passenger already in the taxi, and I just want to skim this table to see how long will it take me to reach a state where I am dropping him off, okay? What I'm going to do first is to define a couple of variables. We have epoches. Now, epoches is how many times do I need to run this until I reach a drop-off until I reach a drop-off location. So initially, it's zero. We are going to count these as we go. Then we have penalties, which we are going to accumulate. Okay, now it's time to run this. I'm going to create an initial value for a flag called dot. It is zero initially, and it represents this flag. So since I am going to enter a loop right now, which is a while not done so i'm going to be looping as long as i'm not getting into a state where we have done meaning that here it is true okay so initially it's zero and now let us iterate this the first thing we are going to learn about is a method called sample now sample is going to take one of these states randomly and start with it okay so we are going to start at a random place in the map. So we're going to say action is equal to environment dot action underscore space dot sample. Okay? So we are using the environment we have defined and we are calling action space dot sample in order to take one sample out of this state table. Now, the next function we are going to learn about is called step. A step function is the one that is going to jump from one state to another, okay? So, when, once we are in this state, we are going to take a look what is the next state, or the function is going to do that, and then it will jump to it. As I said, Gym Library has a lot of built-in function that will help you just focus on the learning, rather than on the inner functionality of how the game is going to play out, 
Okay. Now this environment dot step is going to take an action. Let's say that the action we have sampled is this one. Now we will pass it to step. Step is going to look inside what is the next state. The next state, let's say, is 100. Now the action is going to sample. Let's say it took this sample here. And then we pass this action to the environment step. The environment step is going to look at the next state, which is 100. And then it will jump to the all the way to 100. And we will be here. Okay. And we will be choosing an action. So we choose an action from here randomly, then pass it to step and so on and so forth. Okay. This is how it works. Now this environment step returns four variables. State, reward, done, and info. So every action it takes, it's also going to tell you what is the reward of it. Okay. And all of this information will be obtained from this table. It will read the done, the reward, and the state. Okay. Now, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say here, if reward is equal to minus 10, let us search here. I'm going to show you. As you can see, there is a lot of states where we have minus 10. And mostly these minus 10 are in action 4 and 5. Meaning that we will be inflicting a large penalty if the taxi tried to pick up or drop off a passenger in the wrong place meaning that if the taxi tried to pick up a passenger on the map where we don't even have a passenger then we are going to inflict a high penalty same thing if we dropped off a passenger somewhere random on the road we would also like to inflict a very large penalty so we are saying here if the reward is minus 10 meaning we stepped and we read that the reward is minus 10 then I would like to increase penalties. So penalties here is just a tracker of how many penalties will I accumulate throughout this brute forcing. Okay, so we are increasing penalties by one. If you forgot about the syntax, this is just meaning penalties equal penalties plus one. Okay, now I would like to create one more variable here. I'm going to call it a frame. I would like to see how the car is being trained. And the way to do that is by storing all of this information and the rendering information as well in a frame. Now take a look. Once I am done from this, I would like to store this frame. I'm going to say frames dot append. And I am going to open a curly bracket right here. I'm going to say the following. Environment dot render. And I need to pass a mode in order to display that, which is NSI. So I am appending. And this is for a key that is called free. Okay. So first I am appending the render. Remember the render function that used to return to us this image right here. Now in every step, I would like to take the image. This is what I am doing. I would like also to store some additional information. This information will be the state, the action, and the reward. I would like to display them. So I'm going to have a state here it is actually state. I have the action which is actually the action. I also have the reward that I would like to depict on my terminal output. And here I have my reward. Okay. And by that, I have appended a frame. What else do I want to do? I would like to see the epoches, meaning how many times I am going to go through this loop. I'm going to say epoches plus equal one. I am incrementing the epoches counter. Okay. Once I'm done, I would like to print. So I'm going to say here, print how many epoches, or I can call this epoches is, and then just say epoches here. And we need also the penalties. I would like penalties accumulated, and I'm going to be just printing penalties. Okay, and we're good. Now, if I try to run this quickly, uh, we still have some issues here. Yeah, this is a comma. Frames is not defined because here it's a frames. Penalties is not defined. Okay, let's run this, but it seems that we still have one more typo here. So this is penalties. Okay, now let's run it. We will see that it took us 195 run 
and we accumulated around 66 penalties. So we did 66 wrong moves here, but eventually we found where the solution is. That took a long time. And since here we are starting at a random state every time, well, it means that we will be getting different approaches every time because we are starting at a different place in the table. Let's try it again. Now it took 2,328 approaches to just do that. See, it all depends on where you start in your space. Okay, now let's try and visualize what's going on. Okay, so what I would like to do right now is to actually print those frames right here to see the learning process. We have stored all the frames in this uh, list here. Now it's time to extract them and display them. To do that, we are going to create a function that is we're going to call display frame. And this display frame is going to be past frame. Now let us iterate over of all of them. We are going to say for i frame enumerate frame. Let's pass frames here so that we know that we are passing multiple frames. Okay. I would like to import one library here, which is called the clear output. Now, a clear output is going to clear this command line area. And this will help when we are displaying frames not to just display all the frames one by one on top of each other. I would like to display a frame, delete the current frame, and display a new frame so that we can get the motion feeling of the frame. How can we do that? There is, there is a library in IPython which is called... We can import something called the clear out. So I'm going to say from ipython.display import clear output actually that, let's just put this on top of the function we don't need to import it inside the function okay so this is my for loop let's clear the output and we need to pass weight equals true now we have passed weight equal true so that the, the, the frames won't be displayed quickly because this display process will probably take few milliseconds per frame and we cannot really notice any change if we just start clearing out and printing very fast. The weight here is going to guarantee that we see the frames changing. Okay, now we are going to print the frames one by one. So we have frame, frame. We have stored everything in here, so we are now extracting them. See, we have in this frame key, we have stored values for the render, and now we are printing them so that we can display it. Let's print the state. So print state, and then we have frame state. We also have the action. So print action, and then we have frame action, and we have the reward. So print reward and then we have a frame reward and finally i would like to print the frame number so i'm going to say print frame number what is a frame number well it is it depends on how many times you are extracting so we can just take this counter i right here and just print it as the frame number all right now i'm going to compile this we forgot the in Now let's call this, we have display frame and we need to pass the frames, this one. Now let's run it. And as we can see, we are seeing it moving. And it took 2,327. All right, maybe this is too fast. How about we make it a little bit slower? If you don't like the speed, we can just stay from time import sleep now at the end i would sleep for about i don't know 0 0.1 seconds so around 100 extra milliseconds now if i execute this we will see that it's a little bit slower and we can see all the learning process maybe this is too long because we have around 2000 
but we are seeing exactly what's going on. Okay, so this is brute forcing, and this is jumping in this table from one state to the other, just so that it can find a state where we have the done flag being true, meaning we have dropped a passenger. Okay, so we are pre-assuming that the passenger here is picked up, and we are just searching for a state where we can drop him off. Okay, so far so good. Now it's time to move to what we call queue learning, which is one of the most famous techniques in order to perform reinforcement learning. Welcome back guys. What we are going to talk about now is the queue learning concept. Now the queue learning is the main or most famous algorithm for reinforcement learning. And its concept is very simple. We would be creating something called the queue table. And this queue table would have a state column and an action column. Here we will have all of our states. In our driving taxi example, we have 500 states, right? So here we start at one and we end up at 500. Now the actions is the whole action space. Remember, we can go up, right, down, left, pick up, or drop, right? So let's say that the one starts here. Okay, now this is my table, this is my state, and these are my actions. Let's say for state one, the goal of queue learning is that when we are jumping to a state, we would have a score for each movement. So right here, we will be initializing all of this to zero, and while we are learning, we will be assigning weights here, like minus one, 1.1, minus 2.1, zero, minus two, three, etc. Okay, this is for state one. And when we are jumping to state two, let's say, let's say we also have weights like one, two, zero, minus one, minus 1.1, 1 .1, and say four. Okay, and let's say 0 0.2. Now assume that we are jumping from state one to state two. We will be looking at the actions. We, when we are jumping from 1 to 2, our algorithm will look at all of these scores and it will choose the highest score. So in our case, the highest score is when we go right. So the 2 will be picked up, meaning that we should go right. Okay. Now this is the intuition behind Q learning. We have a table of state action and we will be registering scores while we are learning. Now, the way we register a score is something else that we need to talk about as well. Now, the formula in order to calculate this, we are going to say here new value is equal to, first I'm going to write it, then I'm going to explain it. 1 minus alpha multiplied by the old value then we will be adding alpha multiplied by reward plus gamma multiplied by max next state score. Okay, now this is my formula, but what does this even mean? Let's say, let's say that we would like to calculate this value. Let's say that right now we are in state one and we are jumping to state 2, okay? Now, I would like to update the value at the current state, okay? So, I'm, go I'm from 1, I'm going to 2. In 1, I did go up. Now, this, when it went up, I would like to update its value, all right? This is what I'm saying here. If I'm going from 1 to 2, I want to update the Q value of the state I am coming from, okay? To do that, we use this formula. New value for that current state is 1 minus alpha. Now, alpha here, you can think about it like the learning rate. Okay? It is very similar to that. And it's a constant that we will be providing at the beginning. 
This learning rate will be multiplied by the old value. 1 minus the learning rate will be multiplied by the, learn by the old value. What is the old value in our case? Well, this is the old value. It's minus 1. So here, let's assume that maybe alpha is equal to 0 0.1. Here we will be having 0 0.9 multiplied by the old value, which is minus 1. Then we will say plus alpha is 0 0.1. Now this 0 0.1 will be multiplied by the reward that we have. What reward did we get when we were at step one, right? So right here, since we were, because we're jumping from one to two, I would like to see what is the reward that we got right here when we went up. So here we will be multiplying this by the reward. Let's assume that the reward is minus one. Then we will be adding this gamma. Now this gamma is going to be controlling the next state weight or the importance of the next state all right so this gamma is also a value a predefined value which let's say it is 0 0.5 at this moment okay so as you can see it is multiplied by the max of the next state score what do i mean by that this is my next state who is the max here is two all right so what I'm doing here is I am multiplying this gamma, which is 0 0.5, by 2. And this gamma here is going to weigh down the importance a little bit of the next state. All right? It's going to adjust it a little bit. So those are our hyperparameters. And these are, that, these are the parameters that need to be adjusted to get a good DQ learning result. All right? And that's it. This is all we need right now. Now we calculate this and we get a certain number. And this number now will go here and be updated. Okay. So it won't be minus one anymore. It will be a number. And then we'll be jumping to the next state. And we will be doing the same process again and again and again and again until we have a full table. Now we're not done yet. This will cause overfitting at the end because we will be memorizing a certain root. Now, we will introduce epsilon. Epsilon is also a constant. And we are going to choose a number that we will compare it to epsilon. This number will be between 0 and 1. Okay? And epsilon as well is between 0 and one, we need to choose it as a constant. So we need to add here epsilon, let's say, is equaling to 0 0.3. Now, depending on the value of epsilon, we are going to be telling the Q learning that I would like to either explore a new route or I would like to use the table. What do I mean by that? Q learning can do two things it can jump to the next state from the table we have or it can jump to the next state by choosing a random state okay choosing random state will help us explore new routes memorizing only the table and following only the table will cause overfitting so we need to balance these two we need sometimes to be taking states from the table sometimes we need to be choosing random values and this is where comes epsilon. We are going to choose randomly a value between 0 and 1 and then compare it to epsilon. If we have a value randomly that we have chosen less than epsilon, then I would like to choose then state will be random. Meaning that I would like to use the method sample. Remember the method sample we have used? We are going to use it. Okay? Now, vice versa. If we are larger than epsilon, then my state is going to be through the table. What do I mean by through the table? It means that I'm taking the max best way. Okay? So, what do I mean by that? Let me again show you. If the value is less than epsilon, then I would come to this table and not choose the max one. I won't be choosing the max one. I will be choosing randomly from those regardless of the score okay now 
if I got a value that is larger than epsilon, well, it means that when I'm jumping to the next state, I'm going to take the maximum. So either I pick up one randomly or I take the maximum from the next state. All right, so this will, so this summarizes a little bit Q-learning. I know there might be some concepts that are not really clear to you yet. That's totally okay. I just wanted to give you an introduction here and now we will get our hands dirty with some code. Let's get started. All right, so what we are going to do right now is start coding our reinforcement learning, Q learning algorithm to solve the taxi problem. First, we are going to import a few libraries. We need NumPy. We need Jim, of course. And that's it. This is all we need for now. Now, let's create the environment really quick. We have Jim make and we have taxi dash version 3 and then we need to say dot environment let's continue let's render this so we will say environment dot render okay we need two parentheses and this is our project now do you remember how we used to check all of our states we used to say environment dot observation underscore space. We need an S here. All right, so we have 500 states. Now we need to create the Q table. We need to do it ourselves. So we'll say Q table is equal to MP dot zeros. Remember the table need to be initialized to zeros initially, and then we are going to create it. We will be putting two parameters in, we have the environment dot observation space, which is our state, right? And we need the action space, which is or the actions we can perform. We have also talked about this before. So we have environment dot action space. Now I want to pass the method n here and here because I don't want this discrete 500. I want only the 500. Right, so let me show you. If I say environment dot action underscore space dot n, I would get the number. If I remove the n, I would get the object. Right, so this is the reason we are passing that n. Okay, and by that we have created our table. We still have a problem. Again, the s in on my keyboard is latching a bit. So yeah, now it works. Let's import also random and the clear output. So from i Python underscore display import clear underscore output. Here we need a dot and we're good. Now, what are we going to do next? Do we remember all the parameters that we need to tune, which are alpha, gamma, and epsilon? We need to define them now. So I'm gonna say Alpha here is equal to maybe 0. Uh, let's say 15. Then we have the gamma, let's make it 0. 0.6. And we have the epsilon, let's make it 0. 0.2. Okay, now we are going to create a for loop consisting of around maybe 800 epochs, which we will use to teach the model. So we'll say for i in range between 0 and maybe 800. Okay, now we are going to reset the environment. So we will say state is equal to environment dot reset. Okay, let's execute this. We're good. Now we are using this reset here in order to get a state every time we loop. So for example, if I try to print this state just to show you what is the output here, you'll see that we are getting a state randomly okay so we have this reset now let's continue what are we going to do next we are going to define a few variables we have we are going to define the epochs and the penalties so epochs is zero and penalties is zero and we need the done flag 
is also zero or we can call it false and now the, remember the while loop that we have used before now we need to do a while loop while not done so now we will be starting the learning process and we will repeat this learning process 800 times okay what is the first thing we want to do remember we talked about this epsilon and this epsilon gave us two choices if we generate a number that is less than epsilon then what i would like to do is to take a state from the action space if it is larger, then I would like to take the maximum next state table. We have talked about this in the intuition lecture. So let's program this. We will say if random dot uniform zero one is less than epsilon. Now, what does this uniform do? I really want to show you here. Let's take it to this cell and just print it we get values as you can see between 0 and 1 from the uniform distribution there is a statistical model that is called uniform and we are getting values from it okay so we are getting values between 0 and 1 now this generation if it is less than epsilon then i would like to sample from my action space so i'm going to say here action is equal to environment dot action underscore space dot sample okay now if this doesn't happen if epsilon is not less then we will go to else what we will do in the else we will be getting the maximum value we will say action is equal to mp dot arg max q underscore table and then we will pass the state and take the highest action. Do you remember what does this mean? Let me recap it quick to you. This is what I'm talking about. I'm saying I would like to take the best or the highest score, right? From the action space. So I'm passing a certain state to it and then taking the highest best action to perform. Okay. And we're good. Okay, now what is the next step? Now it's time to create, now it's time to move to the next state. So we are going to say here next state reward done and info. We've done that before when we were brute forcing. When we call the step function, so we'll say environment.step function, meaning jump to the next state that we have in our state table i'm not talking about the queue table here i'm talking about the table of state that we used before with this that comes along with this taxi problem okay we have explained this in details now now to calculate the new value remember we needed the old value and the next max right let me remind you this is our formula here we needed the old value we need now to create a variable for it so that we can use it in the formula and we needed the max of the next state. So let's go to these two variables. I'm going to say here, old value is equal to q underscore table. And we will pass it the state and the action. Okay. This is our index. Now let's say the next maximum value is going to equal to np.max then we need a q table and we need to pass it the next state right so we are using the q table to get the current score right and we are using the q table to get the best next state score okay if you are still feeling confused about this i really suggest that you repeat the intuition lecture we have talked about Okay, so far so good. Now it's time to apply the formula we have talked about. Let us now calculate the formula in order to calculate the new value. I'm going to say here new value is equal to 1 minus alpha multiplied by the old value plus then we have alpha multiplied by reward plus gamma 
multiplied by next max. This is the formula we have learned. Now it's time to update the Q table. How can we do that? Very simple. We will say Q table for that certain state and action state action is equal to new value. And that's it. This is how we update the Q table. Now, how about we see how many penalties we are inflicting throughout the training? We will say if reward is equal to minus 10. We also see in this syntax when we were brute forcing, we will say penalties is plus equal 1. We are incrementing penalties. What's next? Well, we need here to do a column and we need an indent block. Now, what are we going to do? Since we are looping, we need to move to the next state. So we are going to say state now is equal to next state, right? Because we are taking an environment here and we are looping until we drop a passenger, right? We are trying to drop a passenger here. So what we are doing is we are choosing a random state and then going here. Either we, for the next state, we choose a random state or we take from the table. Now, since we are in this loop right here, I would like to progress with my state. How can we do that very simply? We would say that now state is nothing but next state, so that we can evaluate the next state. And we keep repeating this. We also need to increment the epochs. So we're going to say epochs plus equal one to increment. Now, how about we show where we are in the training? So I would like to print this number, but I want to teach you something new. I don't want this number to be repeating like this as a list. I would like it to update above itself, but I also don't want it to update for every new loop. I would like it to be displayed only when we progress with the hundred loop. How can we do that? We will say if I reminder 100 is equal to zero, then I would like to clear. So I'm going to say clear underscore output. Then we need to say wait equals true. And then just print training loop number is i. Okay, and that's it. Now let me execute these cells. We will execute this one and this one. Let's see what issues we have. We have while not done. Yes, it's not a function actually. What else? New value is not defined. Yes, because it's not new underscore value. It is just new value like that. And here we go. We are now training. See, we are at 100, 200, 400, 700, and we are stopping. Even though we have 800 here. And this is how we train our model. Now it's time to see the results. Okay, how about we add the frames appending to this problem so that we can illustrate the frames we have. I'm gonna say here frames is equal to this and I'm gonna add the frames code at the end. You can get this code from the brute forcing problem. So by that we are appending every frame we have and let's run this okay now let's print the q table and see the learning we were doing as you can see the q table is filled as expected it is actually learning something now what i want to do is i would like to get the same display function we used before and display the frames of what we were doing. So if I run this right now, I'm going to remove the sleep. I want it to display a little bit faster and run. As you can see, it, well, it's running too fast. Maybe I should have not deleted the sleep. But as you can see, there is a lot of successful movements here. It means that our model is really performing well. Okay, let's force a stop this. And now I'm going to have a delay here of maybe 0.05. And then we will be running everything. Let's wait until it trains. 
And now, as you can see, it is learning. These are all the learning steps that we had. When it's green, it means that we are picking up and we are waiting to drop. As you can see, it is improving because it is now picking up and it is able to actually deliver. As we are progressing, we will see that this model is performing better and better because these frame numbers are representing the learning process. And as we progress, we can see the performance getting better. Let's stop this. And that's it. You can. We're going to stop here and you can actually continue to see the performance getting better and better. And by that, we have finalized this small project and we have towed a car to pick up and deliver passengers. I hope that you have enjoyed this small project. Hello, Marhaba. Hola, Konnichiwa. The words coming out of my mouth right now is something you and I can understand easily. And we really don't need to analyze it a lot to comprehend what, what the other person is saying. But how can we make machines understand that? This is one of the largest fields out there, which is called natural language processing. This is the underlying infrastructures of devices like Amazon Alexa or the Apple Siri. This technology has tons of applications, starts from chatbots all the way to humanoid robots. So let's dip our toes in that large ocean. And now we are starting a new section, which is called NLP or Natural Language Processing. Now, this is a very, very exciting topic because it's about how can you analyze a text and make sense of it using machine learning and artificial intelligence. What are the applications of NLP? I mean, where can we use this? We see NLP in our daily life. Let's say that you have an email and everybody knows the spam folder. There is an NLP algorithm. And this algorithm here is classifying if a certain email is a spam or not. Let's say we have a text here. We are making sense of this text in order to categorize it either a spam or not a spam. A second application is in movie reviews. Let's say we have a table full of reviews about a certain movie. From the tone of the language, we can specify if this is a positive review or it is a negative review. So the amount of applications here is really huge. Another application would be having a chat box. A chat box, we see it right now in every modern browser. We also see it in uh, devices like Alexa. It's not entirely a chat box, but it is a speech to text recognition. It takes our speech and it translates it to text. Then it uses NLP to process this text and to make sense of the important keywords we are saying. And then using some machine learning and deep learning algorithms in order to generate a reply. So NLP is about how can we make sense of a language in order to solve our daily life problems. Now, the first NLP concept that I want to talk about is tokenization. Tokenization is very simple. Let's say that we have a text like this is a text. What do you think is the first thing we want to do when we want to process it? Of course, we would like to store it in a list. And this is what tokenization is. It is taking every single word and consider it as a token by storing it in a list. Now, let's take a look and program this. Now, the first thing we want to do is to import tokenize from NLTK. So here we're going to import NLTK and then we are going to say from NLTK dot tokenize import word underscore tokenize and we need to download from NLTK the following download punct okay run this and here we go now we are ready to give an example let's say that I have a string here 
we'll call it st and we were going to write the following this is a long text that we would like to tokenize okay let's execute the cell and you are going to say word underscore tokenize we are going to call this function and pass it st see here we have imported word tokenize now we just pass it st the sentence and this is what we will get this is a long text that we would like to tokenize and it is in a list now let's add some commas this is the long text that we would like to tokenize dot then let's say let's do this now i want to import something else which is called sent for sentence tokenize let's see the difference between a sentence tokenizer and a word tokenizer so here we're going to say send underscore tokenize and pass it st we need to execute this first then let's do this as you can see it took only the first sentence it stopped at the full stop point and it gave me a sentence so this has its own applications but mostly we would be using word tokenize now i want to come here quickly and explain the concepts of stop words stop words are words like a the and to in all of those are redundant and sometimes do not convey a meaning when we are trying to pre-process the text okay so we would like sometimes and not in all cases but in most cases we would like to strip out these words out of our sentence and ltk library has some really good methods in order to do that let's take a look now let's see how we can work with tokenized word we are going to say from an ltk dot tokenize import word underscore tokenize and then we have from an ltk dot corpus import stop words okay we are just importing these two libraries quickly we have a typo here it is tokenize and we're good now let's create a sentence let's say s is equal to this is a sentence that contains a few stop words that we do not want okay before we can use stop words we need to tokenize first we have learned about tokenizing we just need to create a variable let's call it token and then we will be saying word underscore tokenize and just pass it the string now you have the token so far so good now we can apply some stop words we are going to say stop underscore words and we are going to say stop words dot words and then just put the language stop words is actually a list of words and we can simply see it let me print it for you this is a print and those are all the words here we have I, me, my, myself. We have around 170 something words. You can take a look at them and examine them. And these are the words that will be stripped. Okay, so stop words are just a list inside an LTK that would help us remove them from our sentences. But how can we remove these words from our sentence? We will be creating a very simple loop. So we'll say for word and token. We are now looping through these tokens now you know what does token contain token contains my sentence but as separate words okay now what i'm gonna say is if word not in stop words i'm gonna append them to a new list i'm gonna say here new list this new list will contain all the words that are not stop word and i'm gonna say here, new list dot append word okay and i'm gonna just print this new list here we go now we have reduced this sentence by a lot actually we have this is is gone a is gone that is gone a few is gone that we do not and want 
we do and not all of them are gone this is what we are left with now it's important that here you apply something called case fold case fold is a method you apply it on a string so that you make it all small letters so let me give you an example p is equal to z okay to yes and like this okay just a very simple nonsense word now if i say uh, print p dot case fold you'll see that it is now all small letters since my dictionary contains all small letters i would like to apply this case fold on my words so that we can have better matching regardless of what we have if the word is a capitalized or not okay now after we execute this we see that this is also gone because the, the t was capitalized and now we have a much smaller sentence okay now this list you can always add to it the stop words list you can add to it remove from it it sometimes depends on how you would like to engineer your features welcome back guys so let's continue with nlp let's say that you have a text that is full of punctuations how would you get rid of them because when you are doing text analysis you really don't want to be considering any commas or full stops you especially when you are doing per se frequency analysis when you are trying to count how many a certain word has occurred if you don't do this pre-processing of removing all the punctuations you might get with the wrong statistics because all those commas are going to be including in your counting let's take an example let's say this is a text and this text is equal to let's open a parenthesis and say this is comma per se comma for example a another comma then a very important issue okay now let's apply what we call a regular expression a regular expression is actually a scripting that is done on a text in order to find patterns in order to extract information now regular expressions are a whole different separate topic that you can learn about which can prove useful in many cases we are going to use a very very simple regular expression that will be looking only for letters and numbers and ignore anything else in a text i'm going to be importing here from nltk dot tokenize then import reg x for regular expression then tokenizer okay so this is a special case of a tokenizer which is a regular expression based tokenizer i'm going to say here tokens is equal to reg x and then tokenizer and here i'm going to be passing it r then open a parenthesis like this a backslash w and plus now this w and plus is what is going to be skimming over this text and only extracting the words without any punctuations now let's continue and here we just need to say from it's not import okay now i'm going to be saying text is equal to tokens dot tokenizer and just pass it the text we have okay now what we're going to say is text is equal to let's take this tokens we have created and then call the method tokenize and pass the text okay so we are taking tokens passing the tokenize function or method then passing the text now if i print this text you'll see that i got it without any punctuations this is per se for example a very important issue that's exactly what i am looking for now this text is more ready for f stuff like frequency analysis so far we have talked about word tokenizing and also stop words there is one more thing that i would like to talk about which is called tagging it's important to know what is the grammatical position of the words we have like do we have adjectives do we have nouns do we have pronouns well 
this can be really useful when we are analyzing our text. I'm going to be using this token one more time and see what will our post tag method in NLTK is going to produce. Okay, so we're going to say here tags, small letters, tags is equal to NLTK dot boss underscore tag. And we are going to be executing the first three cells only. Okay, now we are going to take this token and I'm going to be passing it here. Let's see how it will be tagged. And also we need to import NLTK. Now let's try this and we need to print tags. Here we go. Now, as you can see, we got a list and each element of this list is a tuple and it contains two values. One of them is the word and the other is the tagging. Now, as you can see, the tagging is just abbreviations. So let's see what do these abbreviations mean. I have Googled it in order to show you guys what are the combinations that we can find. There is a great answer on, on Stack Overflow that we can check. Here we have, let's say this is a DT. Let's see what is a DT. See, there is a lot of tags. So this is a determiner and that's correct. We have the is, it is VBZ. And if we check VBZ, we would get that it is a present tense, a verb. Okay, let's check this sentence. It's a an, an, an. It is, it should be noun. Let's take a look. It is a noun. And we can continue like that. Let's check the few. Few is JJ, which is an adjective. Want, VB. And VB is actually a verb or a base form. We have VBD, which is a past tense. We have VBG, which is a present tense. We have almost all the taggings that we could need. Now we can use this in order to process this text further. All right, so right now we are going to be talking about limitizers. Limitizers are one of the most important algorithms that are used in NLP because with limitizers, we can reduce any word to its stem or base form. So if we have the verb go, gone, went, all of them will be reduced to go. And this helps your learning model to understand the text easily because for us it might be important to know all of these variations but sometimes when we are processing text it might not be that important and we would like maybe to treat all of those variation equally by just converting them to the base form now there is multiple steps to do word limitizers and we are going to see how we can do that so i have imported from an ltk stem word net limitizer this is new we already know here the post tag and the word tokenize, and then we have from corpus, we have word net. Okay, now I'm going to execute this and let's start creating an object for word net limitizer. So this is lem, and then here I have word net limitizer. Okay, now let's create a sentence. Let's say something like, I am giving you the opportunity of learning new materials okay let's start by tokenizing this so before we can do any limitization we need to tokenize this is the first step in any nlp pre-processing so we are going to say here token is going to equal to word underscore tokenize and then we will be passing the text let's just print the token quickly and we have tokenized it okay now, after tokenization, we are going to try to apply the limitizer directly. Okay, so I'm going to be saying for T in tokens, L for limitizer is equal to lem, which is this object here, dot limitize. And then I am passing these tokens one by one. And let's print it. Let's call it tokens, actually. Okay. Now, as you can see, well, it did not do that well, because here we have the I am giving is still as it is. The only thing it did is just reducing material to materials, because this limitizer initial uh, value is converting nouns only. But we need a way to make it convert verbs as well. So right now there is a default value being passed to this limitizer that need to be changed. And this default value is noun. Now, does this remind you of something? 
Yes, it is actually the tagging. Before we can limitize, it's important that we tag all the words and pass it to the limitizer so that it knows how it should reduce it to the base form. So let's do that. Okay, so now what we need to do is to apply tagging before we go into limitizing. Let's do that here. After tokenizing, we can start the tagging. How can we tag? We have already learned that. Let's create a variable called tags and then just call pose underscore tags or tag. Then just pass tokens. Now, if I just print tags, as you can see, I have got the grammatical meaning of every word I have. So far, so good. Now, what I want to do is, when I am in my limitizer, I would like to pass here this tag. Okay, but how can we do that? This is where the role of corpus wordnet is going to come handy. We are going to pass these tags to it, and it is going to return to me if the word is adjective, a verb, a noun, or an adverb because this is the most important group to convert adjectives verbs nouns and adverbs okay all of these tags are going to be falling into one of those four categories only and the way to do that is by using wordnet now wordnet is going to pass the simple that is required for limitization let me show you what i mean if for example i just say wordnet dot adjective and i just print it I will get A. So A is the letter that I can pass here to tell the limitizer that I have an adjective. Now let's try something else. Let's try wordnet.verb. It's going to return V. So for verbs, I have V. Let's try some adverbs. Adverbs is R. And then nouns, it is returning N. So we are going to create a function. We are going to be passing these to it check the first letter and it will return accordingly what do i mean by checking the first letter take a look here now what we're going to do is check the first letter of each of those and then return the corresponding wordnet letter that is compatible with lemmatize okay let's see how we can do that let's just define a function here and i'm gonna call it tag return tag okay and I'm going to be passing it a tag. Now I'm going to say f tag dot start with. This is a Python function that checks the first letter. J, what I would like to return is the corresponding letter for adjectives. So word net dot adjectives. Okay. Elif tag dot start with, let's say V, what I would like to return. Word net dot verb, capital letter. Elif tag start with let's say n for noun i would like to return word net dot noun and finally the adverb so elif tag dot start with r then also return the word net dot adverb now word net is like a huge kind of dictionary that you can read about which has a lot of interesting applications actually now we are using it here only to return the corresponding letter that is compatible with lemmatize okay now we could have just created a simple table for that but i wanted to teach you a little bit and introduce you to the wordnet from corpus okay what are we going to do now is what if we don't pass it any of those let's say that the word does not fall into these groups then I would say else just return on. Okay. Now we are ready to modify this. I don't want to be iterating over the tokens. I would like to be iterating over my tags, those, because I'm going to take the word and take the grammatical meaning of it and pass them both here. Okay. I'm going to say here for T in tags this time. I'm going to say tag is equal to call this function, return tag and just pass it these okay so where are those those are in t index one so this is t index zero and this is t index one and i am looping over all of them to return it now what i want to pass here is t zero for the limitizer right because i am passing those this is t zero and i want to pass the tag all right and now we are ready to print l but there is one more catch here. What if we return none? 
we need to check the tag here before we limitize and say if tag is not equal to none then i would like to do this stuff okay then i would like to limitize then we will be printing the word after limitization all right let's give it a go so let's compile this here we need this to be in a quotation sorry it's a big quotation here so this is the first one second one third one and here it's return okay we're good let's re-execute everything and let's execute the final code okay we forgot to add s to all of those so let's add those so this is s this is s and here we have another s and here we go we are executing now now as we can see we have some repetitions and that's because we are printing l so when we have none we are printing the same word from the previous loop of the l what i want to do is if the word does not does not fall into any of these categories i would like just to print the tag as it is so i'm going to be printing t1 okay say l is equal to t1 and then just print l okay now let's try again here we go sorry t0 for the word okay now look how it was converted i b give you the opportunity of instead of learning we have learn new instead of materials we have material so this is way way better after tagging limitization and tagging comes hand in hand to create a powerful and meaningful algorithm and welcome back now we are going to learn how we can use a frequency distribution analysis frequency distribution analysis is very important to count how many times did a certain word occur in a text this can have a lot of application when we do web crawling for example and we would like to see how many times is a certain keyword is used in a certain page you can use this in order to take an impression of a certain book is this book is biased towards a genre like comedy like history like romance so all of those can be obtained from frequency analysis by just calculating how many times certain patterns or certain words occur i'm going to be taking an example for this analysis from wikipedia let's just copy this uh, page which is about python i'm going to be copying a random section in order to analyze it now let us put this section in a variable let's say this is a text and if you wanna uh, add a very very long text in your python editor you need to create three quotations like this so you have three now paste your text and just add three at the end to close it okay so this is a whole text in a variable called text and we want to analyze it so far we have imported here frequency distribution library and you already know stop words and word tokenizing i'm gonna be using only these techniques which are stop words and word tokenizing you are more than welcome to use limitizing as well which comes in hand with uh, words tagging but for now i'm just gonna be using these two let's take a look first off i'm gonna show you what happens if i try to apply frequency analyzer without getting rid of all the punctuations like full stops commas etc okay let's create the stop word object so we have stop is equal to stop words dot words english now to make sure that there is no repetitive words we are going to create a set a set is going to remove any repetition in a text now this will return a, a huge list with all the words that is considered stop words we have already talked about stop words and now we are going to be creating a very simple list comprehension in order to iterate over all the words in the text convert them into small letters and make sure that they are not a stop word and then saving them here in this text we're going to do all of this in just a very simple list comprehension we're going to say word for 
words in text okay then the condition is if word make sure we convert it to a small letter before we apply the condition so we have if word case fold is not in stop meaning that if any of those words is not considered a stop word i would like to create a new list of them okay and execute now we can print text and as you can see it took them as letters why because we did not do one more step before stop words which is tokenizing is we have text is equal to word underscore tokenizer and just pass it the text okay but let's remove okay now let's just remove this r all right let's execute okay now let's execute the first one because we want text to equal to the original text and then let's execute the second one and here we go we got everything in a tokenized list and we have removed all the stop words let's see how many words did we actually remove by just printing the len so let's say print len text and this will be len of text before stop words okay and then we will print it again right here and we are going to say after okay let's ex execute everything from the beginning and as you can see we have a lot of stop words that do not add any value to my text analysis we have removed over 16,000 words let's take a look again at what are the stop words exactly so we have a stop here they are all of these words see actually they don't add any value to our text all right now let's continue let's start with the frequency which is the purpose of this tutorial right now we are going to create a variable called frequency and we are going to call frick dist from the library we have imported and then we need to pass text to it as simple as that now let's see what is the most common 10 words in this text this can be simply done by just saying frick dot most common and then pass how many words do you want to return let's say the most frequent 10 words and as you can see we got all commas and punctuations parentheses and we had python as well surprisingly so what i want to do now is get rid of all the commas and full stops this is why i told you it's really important that we apply a regular expression on this text to remove and strip it out of all of these commas okay i'm going to be doing this at this stage and i'm going to be calling from an ltk dot tokenize import reg a tokenizer okay next let's create the expression so we have tokenizer is equal to reg x tokenizer and the expression is as we have learned at the beginning of this section or backslash w plus okay now let's apply it so we have text is equal to tokenizer dot tokenize text then we are calling stop words now we don't need to tokenize it again because we already did this so we can get rid of this line and we're good hopefully let's run this yes we need to run the first one first we need to get the text back to this variable and now let's run it as you can see the len before stop words now is only three thousand so we had a lot of commas that were making this problem okay so we did strip it out now let's see what are the most 10 common words and here we go it is python and it was repeated 87 times we have the number three which was repeated 36 times we have a statement we have programming we have c we have expressions used code and operator so those are the most common 10 words let's see most common 20 words we have object operator block functions reference variable syntax so this is really cool i would like you now to just go to any wikipedia page and try to apply these and apply limitization as well along them and see if you would get different results okay and by that we have concluded the frequency analysis
Hello guys and welcome back. In this lecture we are going to be implementing a spam detector. We have a data set that is full of SMS messages and we would like to filter them to know which messages are considered a spam and which ones are considered harmless. We see these spam detectors everywhere nowadays. We can see them on our mobile phones where we have that small folder that we call it spam. We see it also in our email address. There is also a special folder that is dedicated to spam emails. How do they work? How can your email provider categorize emails and tell exactly if this is a harmless or a spam email? This is the topic of this section right here. And this is the project we are going to implement. And it is going to cover a lot of aspects from NLP, pandas, machine learning. So there is a lot of techniques that we are going to use in this compilation project. So get ready and let's get our hands dirty implementing this project. First off, I want to show you this email list. So there is a guy who actually compiled all of these SMSs and he actually labeled them if they are harmless like he's calling them ham or a spam so we have hams and spams let's take a spam example we have england which is macedonia do not miss gold teams news these are advertisement and in most of the cases advertisement is went to spam at least in the bit older technology now in the newer technology we would see that there is a specific folder dedicated for advertisement and if we have a data set that is labeled with advertisement we can do the same thing and even categorize this list to three categories ham spam and advertisement so right now advertisement are going to be considered as spam now let's take a ham example like hi babe i'm at home wanna do something so these are ham where are you how did you perform this is also a ham so this data set consists of 5574 messages that's a lot and we can do a lot with this data now let me show you what is the process we are going to follow in order to solve this problem so this is my spam detector what i have here is only a table right that consists of label and message okay this is all i have what i want to do is i would like to pass this somehow to naive bias algorithm this is naive bias and i would like to get a label or a prediction or a classification to ham or spam so i want to train this model to do that but with this format it's impossible to do it because here we have a label and some really long text i mean how can naive bias actually classify this i need to convert this into something else what i want to do eventually is to create a model like that which is going to take a vector of words or a list and just predict a label ham slash spam okay this is the final result but what actually i want to do as well i would like to train it so there should be some training here and this is the format for training as well but how can i create a vector word what is a vector of words well the first step is to combine all the words together so I'm going to be collecting all the unique words from all the messages and create a very, very large vector that could consist of, I don't know, 8,000 words maybe. Then what I would like to do next is to actually apply some NLP because I want to reduce the words that are not necessary. And I would like to convert the words into their stems so i would like to apply everything that i have learned in natural language processing so that the training process is easier number three i would like to create a frequency for every word i have and we removed this okay i need the frequency meaning let's say i have the word 
win and it is repeated five times in one message i would like to know how many times a certain word is repeated now what else would I like to do i would like to create the vector now which is all the words let's say win lose let lottery all the words and then i would like to have a frequency here two times and this is for every message so let's say this is message one this is message two let's say win here was repeated two times lose is zero let is zero lottery is zero times in message two win is zero lose is zero let is zero maybe lottery is repeated one time and we will continue like that for all the messages okay so the pre-processing is actually going to be longer on a little bit harder than the modeling itself and this is the reality you spend way more time on pre-processing your data preparing it so that it is suitable for your prediction model and after we are done with all of this we will be able to predict single entries so right now we train the model on all the messages all of them okay and we created a model for that and now what i would like to do with this model is to actually give it from here a single message out of this list or data set that i have and this single message then will be predicted at a spam or ham okay because this is my final goal my final goal is to prepare a model so that it is generalizing what is a spam and what is a ham so that i can pass it individual messages that i would get in the future and to be able to predict it now let's get our hands dirty and let's start implementing this project i am really excited to start this section with you guys because it will be including a lot of techniques that we have learned and we are going to be applying them in one project first here i have imported some libraries we already know nltk pandas numpy tokenize uh, stop words from corpus and of course we have the wordnet limitizer so let me compile this and get ready to start importing my data i'm gonna say here data is equal to pandas.read underscore csv and i'm just gonna pass the path of my data set here which is included in the attachment and you can download it and follow along now there is one thing in this data that it is separated by spaces so you need to specify that the separation is equal to t which is for spaces some data like a regular csv file but here since this is a text file we need to separate it by spaces even though we are using csv to read it that's totally fine as long as you are separating it correctly then you have no issues and what i mean by separation is the separation between every message finally we would like to create columns for the data we have so we're going to say here names is equal to label and we have message now simply we could say data dot head and just to see what we have here as you can see we have all of our messages with label and message column okay nothing fancy so far what i would like to do right now is to define a small function that is going to pre-process the messages remember i would like to apply stuff like stop words limitizing i need to apply all of that so let's do it i'm going to say here define pre-process and i'm going to pass it some data first i would like to convert all of my data into a lower case i would say data equal data dot lower so that i don't have a problem between capitalized words and non-capitalized words there would be treated equally now i'm going to say here lem is equal to word net limitizer and this is the object for it now we can tokenize our data so i'm going to say here words is equal to word underscore tokenize and then i'm going to be tokenizing the data okay what's next i would like to apply some stop words so i'm going to say here words is equal to i'm going to use list comprehension again so here we have word for word in words if word not in stop words 
dot words and then just pass English. Okay. We have seen this syntax before when we were talking about stop words and also when we created that small project regarding frequency on Wikipedia pages. Okay, so what's next? Of course, it's limitization. We have words is equal to... Now, bear with me here because we are going to use list comprehension this time for limitization. And I won't be applying that function that chooses adverbs, nouns, and whatever. I would like to only apply it for verbs. And that's fine for such a small data set because what I'm concerned here about is only verbs being converted to their base form. Okay? So if I see that the performance is not that good, I could apply a limitizer that passes for adjectives, for nouns. But for now, I would like only to limitize verbs, okay? So I'm going to say here, lem.limitize. And I'm going to be passing word. And position is v, all right? This is for the tagging. So we are only concerned about verbs. Now we are going to see for word. So it's like, this is, it's like saying word for word. You know, like x for x, it's just list comprehension. But instead, we are limitizing, and whatever the result is, is going to be for word. Okay? So this is just a regular list comprehension. Then we say in words. Okay? So it's like word for word in words. We are exploding them or expanding them. And finally, I would like to convert all of those to string again, because I'm not really done pre-processing but this is only the first step so i'm going to say here words is equal to how do we convert a, from a list to a string we just open up quotation mark like that and then call the method join and just we pass the list okay by that we can convert any list into a string okay and finally we would like to just return words uh, we have some invalid syntax let's see where did we go wrong here all right, here we did not actually say not, we said no. Okay, and now we're good. This is our function. And welcome back. What we would like to do at this moment is to actually test this preprocess function. We can simply do that by calling a test, by creating a test variable. And let's read this first message. I'm going to say data. From the column message, I would like to take the first message, I would like to print it before processing, and then I would like to process it by calling preprocess and pass this test to it, and then print it after it is being processed. Okay, so now preprocess is compiled, and the next one. Let's take a look. We have decapitalized all the words, that's good. We have removed the stop words, that's good. But since this is really just slangs and messages full of typos because people are writing without autocorrect maybe, stem limitization did not do very well. And that's okay. For this stage, we are doing still pretty good. But still here we have some full stops and points and commas that I really don't want. How about we we use a regular expression or the regular expression tokenizer in order to get rid of that. We can say here from nltk dot tokenize import reg exp tokenizer and let's apply it there. So it's very simple. Remember, regular expression takes only strings. So we will do it after we convert here back to string. We can do it at this stage as well, so it's not really an issue. So we have tokenizer is equal to regular expression tokenizer and then the regular expression is r open a parentheses we need a back slash w and plus okay next we will say words is equal to tokenizer dot tokenize and then pass words and then i would like to convert it back to string so let's do this we will copy the first the same statement and we should be good to go. Let's compile this and this. As you can see now, we got rid of all the points around and as well for commas, if we have any, let's take a different message maybe. We got rid of exclamation marks as well, question marks. Well, that's totally okay. Now, 
what we would like to do is to create the table that we will be passing. As we talked about, well, messages cannot be passed as they are and they need to be pre-processed. I will create a dictionary now, process messages, and this dictionary is going to contain a key for label, the value is list, then we have for messages, also a list, and then we need the frequency of every word in the messages. Okay, so right now we are ready to pre-process those messages with the function we have created. I'm going to say here for i in range from 0 to len of data messages. Since I have a lot of messages, I would like to process only a small part of them at least while I am developing because I want the functionality to work rather than the actual training because we might do mistakes and since this takes a long time in the pre-processing I would like to only take maybe the first 300 or 400 messages this is why I would like to do here minus 5000 meaning I don't I want the total number of messages minus 5000 this will leave us with around 400 okay now i am iterating over all the messages i have in my data now this is what i would like to do i would like to append to this message all the pre-processed messages okay so i'm going to say process underscore messages dot append what I would like to append is the message being processed. So I'm going to call a pre-process and I'm going to be passing the messages, right? So I'm going to say hey, data message index i. And after I'm done, I would like to convert it to a list. So after I pre-process it, I'm going to convert it here to a list. Let's close the data parentheses here. And we're good. What do I want to do next? I would like to also append the label. So I'm going to say here, pros messages. We already have the label stored in here, right? In the data label. So I'm going to say here, label dot append data label and the index, of course, from i. And finally, I would like to just print this. So pros messages. Okay, we got an error. Dictionary does not have a method append. Okay, here we forgot to just pass the messages. Okay, and we're good. Let's run it. As you can see right now, we have a dictionary of label containing all the labels and then the messages. Okay, this is what we are looking for at the moment. What I would like to do right now is to create a few more functions. So far we created one function here and we have processed all the messages and separate them into label and messages, but we still need to get the frequency. Let us add one more function to this function area here. I'm going to call this function store all words. Okay, this function is going to take all the words in all of my messages and just to create a giant list of every single word. Okay, so I'm going to create here a simple all words list. It's empty initially. And of course, here I'm going to be passing a list and this list will contain all of my messages. I'm going to say here for item in li. So iterate over every message and just append that word i'm gonna say here all words dot append item let's call it word so it is more explanatory and here let's just uh, append a word and then i'm just gonna return all words all right now i'm gonna create another function that will get me the most common words and then append them to a data frame okay so i'm gonna say here diff get most common words i'm gonna pass it a list and an index because i'm gonna be passing the messages one by one here and an index we'll see what we will do with that in a minute first i would like to define a global for df because i want to modify it then we are going to call a frequency and an ltk dot frick dist and for every list of words I send it, I would like to get the frequency, okay? 
and store it in the frequency variable. Now I would like to say frick is equal to frequency dot most underscore common and the len of frequency. Now you might ask why would I do that? It's really annoying actually to extract the words from frequency distributor. The easiest way is by using most common and it returns most common 5, 10, 20 or whatever words we have. But if I want all the words to be returned, this is the easiest way. I say most common and I simply pass all the words, right? Whatever the length of these words is, I'm going to pass it. So if, if I have 2000 words, I'm saying return the most common 2000 words. Because as I said, this object, it, it's really annoying to get the uh, all the words from it. And this is the easiest way. Okay, here's what's next. I'm going to say for f in frequency meaning for every word in frequency i would like to do the following df f0 then index is equal to f1 now bear with me i have columns that are equal to the number of words in all of my messages now i would like to iterate on every message and check how many times is that has that word occurred let me show you again i have a data frame that contains all the words. Remember, I had win, lose, lottery, etc. Okay? And I have message one, message two. This is what I'm doing. I'm taking every message and I am checking every word and then saying, okay, the frequency distributor returned that this word has three elements. So I'm searching in my data frame. I found the word and just writing three here. Okay, same thing for the next word. I am iterating over my message, decomposing it into words, getting this word, searching for it in my data frame, and then saying how many times it repeated using the frequency distributor. Let's say one and then two. Then we get the next message. Two, three, one, whatever. Okay, this is how we are filling our table. We are searching for that word and putting a value as how many times it was repeated, which is the frequency. So this is exactly what we are doing here. Now we are going to test all of this. Let's see the results of our functions. Now, what I'm going to be testing is this store all words function initially. I'm going to say here all words is equal to store all words. Then I'm going to pass the whole column. So I'm going to say here pros underscore messages and then all the column message. Now let's print all words. And also I would like to print the len of all words. But I'll do that in a minute. Um, yeah, we need to recompile this. And let's jump back here. As you can see now, we have a list of all the words. Now let's see what is the length of this all words. So I'm going to say len all words. It is 572. Now let us print all words. Okay, this is not good. We having a list inside multiple lists. What we want to do is to create one whole list that contains everything. It means our function is not working. And that's why. We have only one for loop. We would like to iterate over every message in the column of messages. Okay, so let me fix this really quickly. I'm going to say here first for message in li, and then I would like to say for word in message. Okay, so first we are taking one message. We are then taking all the words in it appending them to this list then taking the second message doing the, th the same thing and we should end up with one list containing all the words so let's see if this fix will work and we're good now we have one list containing everything that we need that's really good let's see what is the length of this all words we have 5810 words and of course, we might have some repetitions. So how can I solve this repetition? Well, I'm going to say here, all words is equal to set all words. Do you remember the set? The set is going to convert the list here to a set, meaning no two elements should be the same. 
So now let's see what is the length of this all words afterward. Now we have only 2065. That's really good. And by that we have tested the first function. Now let's create a data frame from what we've done so far. And then I would like to test the second function, which is getting the frequency or getting the most common words. Let's say df is equal to paint the data frame dot data frame and the columns what are my columns for the data frame? We just saw that. The columns, those are all my words. Okay, where are all my words? They are stored in all words. So columns is equal to all words, right? Now, if I print this DF really quickly, you'll see that I have a huge table consisting of 2065 columns, but we still have no entries. It makes sense so far. Now, let's create some entries. But before that, I want to insert the label as well here, just because I want to really see them together, okay? Because later we're going to drop this, but just initially because I want to see what's going on. Because I want to see everything combined together. I'm going to say here df.insert. Where do I want to insert it? I want to insert it here at the beginning. So I want to insert it at index 0. And then what is the label of that column? It's literally label. And then we have here pros messages label. Right? I would like to take all the labels that I have. Everything. All these labels. And I would like to just Put them in my DF. Okay, now let's see what do we have in this DF. Great. I have a huge table right now and it's full of NANs, but at least I have my labels here correct. Okay, so here it is 572 by this. Okay, what's next? I would like to test my other function. So I'm gonna be iterating again over everything. Let's say 4 i in range from zero to the len of my pros messages and then here messages i would like to iterate over all of my messages let's first fix this for because it's not or it's for now we are going to loop over frequencies i'm going to say freak is equal to get freak of words now we are going to say set pros messages then we have message and here we have i so we are iterating over every message creating a set of it and then we will say here get most common words now we are testing our function we are passing frequency and i what i am intending to have now is to return the word and if it exists in the table or not okay so let me show you one more time i want to create a table this is my data frame this is remember this is win this is lose uh, this is lottery and here is my message number one and we're going to say is there a win word here either I would say yes or no and I used the frequency analyzer to do that here say no no yes say message two here yes there is win there is no lose there is no lottery etc I'm creating a binary table like that we could either create frequencies or we could create a binary table just like this. Now, if we execute this, our get most common word is not defined. Let me recompile this. Copy the name here. And just maybe we had a typo. Yeah, we said ger instead of get. Let's run this and we're good. We have executed our function without any errors. But what is our function is giving us exactly? Well, if we are to just put a small print statement here to print the frequency and then run the program again, we will see that we got every word, we got lists of multiple lists for every message we have a list actually, and we got every word that is repeated okay now all we need to do is take those now and and what it did is it did merge this with our df meaning that it was searching for go in our data frame if it found it it will put one as a frequency search for the next one the next one the next one and just filling up the table now let's remove that print 
and let's clean our table right now our table is still unreadable because if i just say df you'll see that i still have tons of nans which i need to drop actually there is a lot of words here that are not nans which we would see once in them okay so if i try to print here uh df let's say go zero i would get one right because as we saw earlier go was in the first message actually if we try to print it if you want now if i say data message zero you'll see that we have go and in our df right now we had go as well take a look go right now has a value of one meaning it was occurring so don't be fooled that this is all nans because we have around 2000 it's normal that we don't see the ones that we have added now what i want to do is to clean this table a little bit so i'm going to say here df is equal to df dot fill na with zero it means that if we did not update it with one it should be zero meaning that let's say in the first message this word never occurred so they should be zero and let's print the f right now and we have a clean table okay so everything we have done so far was actually just data processing and as you see data processing does take a lot of time in order to bring it to a form that is acceptable by the model we are trying to predict with now let's try and write our model i'm going to be importing two libraries here one of them is the sklearn model selection for the splitting of training and testing data and we have the gaussian naive bias we have talked about both of these intensively and now we are going to use them in order to predict i'm going to create a variable here called x spam meaning those are my features namely all of those those are my features and the only thing i don't want is this label so we are going to drop it let's drop it we will say df dot drop and then we will pass the name label and the axis which is one so this is axis one and by that we have created our x spam now y spam is going to be df and it will be specifically only the label right this is what i want to predict this is my y and these are my features now it's time to split them so we're going to say x train x test y train and y test is going to equal to train underscore test underscore split and we will pass it x spam and y spam okay now let's create the model we will say model is equal to gaussian naive bias now let's fit it we will say model dot fit we have x train and we have y train and then we will be doing some prediction we're going to say y predict is equal to model dot predict what would we like to predict of course the x test and then i want to import one more thing here which is the accuracy score so we have from sklearn dot metrics import accuracy underscore score okay so we created our features our labels we have split those into testing and training and finally we created a model with we trained it and now we are trying to predict with it let's see what will be my accuracy how can we do that well we are going to say accuracy underscore score we need to compare y test with y predict right so let me recap this line a little bit we are predicting a portion of those right because we have split them and then we are getting the actual results so we are like passing those data to the prediction model and we already have the ground the truth and we are comparing them and by comparing them we can get what is the accuracy of our model so let's execute this uh yeah white test here this is a capital letter and here we go we got 0 0.88 what i want to do now is actually create the small function that is going to predict single data so far we are getting our table splitting it and 
only predicting on a portion of the table. What I want to do is having new entries and be able to predict them. Let's do that. Now let's write a small code that is going to pre-process any sentence or a message, then it will determine if it is a spam or not. Now there is the thing. You cannot really give your model a text and just expect it to predict it. You need to convert your text to the same format we are using, otherwise it won't be able to predict and you will have some errors. Let's see how we can replicate the same steps that we had for only one sentence or one message. Let's say that we have a test text and well, let, a, let it equal to I owe this one million to you. It could be anything actually, just be it any sentence we want. Now let's say that we have test text dot. What I would like to do now is to pass this text into my pre-processing function. We already have a pre-processing function that we can use. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say pre-process my test text. Okay, and we did this. Now, if I just print it, you'll see that I got rid of most of the words and we got only oh, 01 million. Okay, now I want to replicate what we have here. I would like to have the features, right? Because what we predict, what we provide to our model, if we take a look here, is actually an X test. And an X test was created from here, from X spam. And X spam is nothing but my features. So I need to replicate this table here with one row for one entry. I don't want the label because this is Y test. I only need X test. So how can we do that? We can do that very quickly using some dictionary. We will say L, for example. And let's open up uh, curly brackets. Now what I would like to do is I want to iterate over all of my keys right here. Okay, those are the keys that we need. So how can we iterate over them? We can say 4k for key in, let's say in df.keys. So we are getting all the uh, data frame keys we have here. We are iterating over them and we are saying if k in test text. And now we are saying if this word exist in that in here anywhere let's say uh the word o let's say it exists here if it finds it i would like to have to put one here okay that means we are iterating over all of those one by one then checking those three words if i can if i can find them here and just put one if i find it anywhere okay now if this works what i would like to do is just say l k is equal to one what does this mean this is how we add a key value pair to my dictionary right if you want to add a new dictionary element you you need a key and a value and here you are saying hey this is my new key and this is my new value add a new entry to my dictionary then we have else l k equals zero meaning if i did not find this word let's say i am comparing this word with here, is it the same? No, then put a zero. If it is the same, yes, then put a one, okay? And that's it. Now we are ready to create a new data frame. I'm gonna call this dfx is equal to pd dot data frame, and we will pass L, and we need to specify the index, which is index zero, and we're good. Now, if I print dfx, sorry, here we need index equals zero, and that's it. Take a look here. We have only one entry. We have all the keys and we have all the values here. We can take a look at what was the L looking like before converting it to a data frame. It looked like this. We were adding entries, key and a value using this statement, key and a value. And that's it. Now we need to do one more thing because if I print DFX, I still have a label. I don't want the label. I'm going to say DFX is equal to DFX again dot drop label and then we have x is equals one okay and we're good now all i need to do is to predict i want to predict if this is a spam or not how do we do that 
Well, we are ready. We would just say model dot. This is the same model you have trained here. Predict. What do I want to predict? The DFX. And as you can see, it labeled it as it's not a spam. Let's say here, congratulations, you won a price. You can see now we predicted it as a spam. Now the last step I want to do here is to save and load the model. Okay, I'm going to create that. We're going to import pickle. Pickle is used to save and load sklearn models and to actually store object data in Python. I'm going to give the file name here, which is going to be spamfilter.sav. And then we will call the method dump. So I'll say pickle.dump. We need to pass the model. And we need to say here open file name and wb. If we execute this, we will be saving the model. And let's write the code to load it. So I'm going to say load model is equal to pickle dot load. Then we have open. We have file name, the same file name we have here. And we will be reading instead of writing RB. And finally, we can use this load model right now. So we can say load model dot predict dfx. So if I execute this and this, I would get the same result. Okay. So here we have saved our model into the same folder as our code. And then we have loaded it into a different variable name and we tried to predict. This is how we save our model.